Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Troy Moling and thank you for joining us this week on Market Journal. This is our last show of May and we've got a good one for you. Real quick though, I do want to mention as United States and global health officials continue to address the spread of COVID-19, UNL is monitoring the situation. Updates can be found at covid19.unl.edu and on the Market Journal website. And beginning the broadcast today, Nebraska farmers and ranchers financially hurting from the COVID-19 pandemic are encouraged to apply for USDA's Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. Also known as CFAP, it provides direct payments to producers negatively impacted by market disruption due to the pandemic. $16 billion is being made available nationwide. Nebraska FSA Outreach Coordinator Bobby Critz Wickham says there's a broad category of eligible commodities. There's four basic categories. So non-specialty crop and wool is a category. And in Nebraska, that includes, you know, our, some of our major crops such as corn, soybeans, grain sorghum, you know, oats and sunflowers, for example. Um, another category is livestock, and that includes cattle, hogs, and um, lambs and yearlings. Uh, third category is dairy, and that looks at uh, milk production for the first quarter of, of 2020. And then the fourth category is specialty crops, and there's a broad list included um, under specialty crops, you know, many of which wouldn't necessarily be produced in Nebraska, but we would have some. Um, maybe that would uh, be able to look at apples and sweet corn and some of those other categories. So a very broad spectrum of commodities for Nebraska in this program. But there is an opportunity, uh, USDA is seeking information if, if your commodity is not included in the program. If you can show you know, that you had a 5% or greater decline in prices during this early time period that's been impacted by COVID-19, you know, you can submit that information to USDA and, and maybe be considered to be included in the program. The other thing I wanted to mention that will be a key thing for eligibility, you know, subject to price risk is a, is a term that um, is associated with eligibility. And so, you know, that looks at um, producers had to um, be subject to price risk as of January 15th and also have ownership in that commodity as of January 15th. And so there's some specific things that we'll be looking at related to uh, contracts and agreements that producers have with buyers that might uh, influence that subject to price risk eligibility question. And we'll be putting out a little bit more guidance on that here soon. We're just encouraging producers to, to take this opportunity to consider this assistance. It's, we are in unprecedented times here, and you know, it just may be a time period where you need a little extra assistance to help uh, get you through to a point where hopefully markets will correct themselves enough to be able to get you know, the prices that you need to sustain your operation going forward. And so um, this will, won't make producers whole, and we recognize that, but we want to provide them as much assistance as we can through this program uh, to help them through this challenging time period. Once more, the USDA is accepting applications for the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program through August 28th. You can get more information and learn how to apply at farmers.gov forward slash CFAP. And we've got a link to that on the Market Journal website too. You can also call their toll-free number at 877 508 8364. Moving on to markets now, and on Tuesday, I was joined by DTN analyst Todd Holtman, and he recently wrote an article for DTN explaining the ag market's response to COVID 19 and how different sectors of ag are simply backed up as the country deals with the pandemic. We began the interview by getting his take on that and seeing if we may be turning a corner. I'd say we did get a little more bullish tone over the weekend, thankfully. And it appears that people are getting more active about getting out into the economy. 
Uh, Wall Street Journal had a very interesting story and they had different statistics showing that to be the case, that we're starting to actually travel a little more, get out on the roads more, and uh, ju just in general, get back to life a little bit more. So that's a, it's a bit encouraging. Obviously, it's a very tough road that we've been on to start 2020 with. Uh, who would have ever thought we'd be facing a global pandemic this year? And I think there was, it was very tough to anticipate just how hard it would be on the demand side of our grain markets. And so when I refer to them as constipated ag markets, just about everywhere you turn, demand is just backed up. It's, it's been hard to distribute the goods out to where it gets needed. And that's true whether it's ethanol or grain or livestock products. And uh, it, it's just been hard at, at every turn. And I also think it's worth noting that in your article, you particularly mentioned soybeans as having the best chance for easing the strain on other crops. Expand on that a little bit. Yeah, uh, Troy, the historical trend of soybean demand has just been fantastic. It's been the real leader in growth for many decades now. And that continues to be true as the world desires more meal, or excuse me, more protein on their plate. And of course, soybean meal is a big market, a part of making that happen. Even when China was dealing with African swine fever and losing their hog herd, uh, world soybean demand still hit record levels year after year, and USDA expects that to happen again this year. Now, we need more confidence here in the U.S. market that we have access to that growing soybean market so that we're not planting 97 million acres of corn and, and creating big piles of uh, corn that's going to be hard to move in the fall. We, we need a healthier balance and, and we need more confidence that we do have access to a big international soybean market that keeps growing for us. And I was also reading an article earlier this week about how Brazil's coronavirus cases have quadrupled in May. So one might assume that the instability there may really disrupt their economy, including their ag markets. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, you know, anytime we hear anything negative, uh, potentially for Brazil, it really perks up our ears because obviously they're our number one competitor in both corn and soybeans. And you're right, they seem to be named as the latest hotspot for coronavirus cases uh, at the moment. And that is a big concern throughout the country. The question comes down to, will it close their ports? And I don't see any sign of that happening yet. And of course, they have a big financial interest to keep those ports open and going. So I, I wouldn't get too uh, optimistic or bullish on prices yet because of that situation, but it's certainly worth monitoring. It is very uh, much an important issue. And this time of year, weather is always big in the news. So how's that helping to shape the markets right now? Well, uh, as far as corn and soybeans go, as you know, the planting pace is off to a, a fantastic start. And uh, we're seeing corn and beans put in the ground like crazy and, and what a uh, 180 degree difference it was from last year. So uh, as far as corn and beans go, it's off to a very good start. Uh, we got more rains over uh, the weekend. There's always gonna be some haves and have not areas when it comes to precipitation. And we'll have to monitor as the season goes. But overall, uh, we have to say good start for the corn and soybean crop on wheat, which is more of a has more of a world attention on crops. There are concerns about dryness in France and Germany. Uh, Southern Russia has also been named as a possible concern, but uh, Ukraine and Southern Russia both have gotten uh, beneficial rains lately. So overall, the, the world wheat crops appears to be off to a, an OK start with some uh, issues to watch. All right, Todd, and finally today, we'll end it with some advice for the folks watching. What do you want to leave us with today in terms of selling strategies or risk management opportunities that we might want to think about to help us move forward? Yes, well, this is normally the time of year we'd like to look at some nice pricing opportunities in corn and, and soybeans comes typically from here to about a month later. But because of coronavirus, our seasonal trends have kind of been turned upside down on their heads. So, Right now we see a corn situation where funds are heavily short. And in this market, I just don't think it's gonna pay to sell down here at these lows. Even if we do get a big crop this year, we ought to get a little better pricing opportunity in the summer. Um, for soybeans, again, we have that big demand question mark, uh, but we don't have the big crop prospect in the fall that we do with corn. So I think in soybeans, we have even a little more time to, to work for a better 
uh, forward selling opportunity in 2020. Appreciate Todd for joining me this week. And we're also going to put a link to the article he wrote that we referenced in the interview on the Market Journal website. I also wanted to get a quick word on the cattle markets this week, too. Mississippi State University livestock economist Josh Maples fills us in on what he's tracking in the futures market and what we need to be watching for. I think the general volatility continues to be the big thing to kind of pay attention to. Um, and, and, you know, we certainly aren't in that same environment that we were when, when it first broke, when we were just seeing a sharp, you know, limit up, limit down, limit up, limit down. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm watching the nearby contract, of course, uh, the, looking at the June contract for live cattle, but I'm also really paying attention to those further out contracts because, uh, you know, what happens with processing over the next month or next couple of weeks or month, uh, is going to have an impact on, you know, what we're looking at in terms of, of cattle in feedlots and, and, and what processing might look like later, later in the year. So. I think there's a really interesting question right now, not only figuring out what's going to happen in the next few weeks, but how what happens in the next few weeks impacts those further uh, expiring contracts. So I'm also keeping a close eye on, on the fall contracts. Next week, we'll be joined by Darren Fessler of Lakefront Futures. If you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll pass your question along. Next up, early spring flooding in 2019 across much of the Western Corn Belt was widespread and damaging. The extent and depth of the sand deposited after the water receded was not expected after the flooding, and the amount of sand deposited in many areas prevented removal or spreading. Though the flooding is long gone, this is one of the remaining obstacles across many acres of grazing land and cropland in Nebraska. Read about ways to use perennial grasses to revegetate the sand deposits in the May Nebraska Farmer. And it's time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, let's say goodbye to the month of May. Can't wait to hear what June has in the forecast. Well, Troy, it's been a pretty interesting week. A lot of cloud cover held in tight in eastern Nebraska and of course a lot of widespread precipitation. I think we're all sick of the clouds. Had a little bit of sunshine, but not like western Nebraska. At least from a standpoint this weekend, unfortunately, it looks like we're going to deal with more cloud cover. There is a shot of some warmer temperatures. And then unfortunately, we look like going to maybe a stormier pattern as we go to the end of next week. So all in all, some positives and some negatives in terms of the forecast going forward. Looking at today's upper air model, we see an upper air trough over the Pacific Northwest and sharp ridging starting to build over the northern and central Rockies. At the surface, low pressure sitting over southwestern Kansas expected at least throw some moisture up and interact with the high pressure over the Great Lakes, generating light precipitation across the state as the day progresses. That will gradually pass through the state during the overnight hours, and we'll start to see the ridge building back in. Unfortunately, another piece of energy will sit down in southwestern Kansas as we start to see another surface low eject out. But it looks like the main precipitation emphasis will be over the central Rockies and possibly into the panhandle. We're going to deal with a lot of cloud cover across eastern Nebraska, unfortunately. By Monday, the high pressure system starts to build into our region. A piece of low pressure does develop in southwestern Kansas. And on the back side of that high, we should see some moisture spill up against the front side of the Rockies, but I don't think any of that's going to spell it into our region. On Tuesday, we start to see that ridge push a little bit farther toward the east and upper air trough building significantly in the western United States. The first piece of energy expected to eject out Tuesday morning into southwestern Kansas. That'll develop thunderstorms along the front range of the Rockies, possibly moving into the panhandle during the afternoon hours. And then as we go into Wednesday, we start to see that uh, trough in the west trying to lift toward the east. One piece of energy ejects out of the southern stream into southwestern Kansas. That's going to generate some pretty significant thunderstorm activity, likely across northern Nebraska and southern South Dakota, potentially moving eastward during the overnight hours. And on Thursday morning, the trough begins to open up and lift toward the northeast projecting yet another piece of energy out into southwestern Nebraska at the surface. That's going to bring Gulf moisture up and override, interacting with the high pressure over the Great Lakes, generating widespread precipitation in southern Nebraska, potentially severe. And on Friday, we start to see the entire troughing pattern move toward the east, and most energy to converts into the northern stream. Low pressure is full organized as many pieces of energy moving out into the central and northern plains. Would not be surprised to see widespread convection all the way from Texas northward into North Dakota. 
and that will probably carry over into at least early next week. And looking a further farther out into the future, next Thursday following Tuesday, we keep that warmth into place, although it might be overemphasized across the northern plains. More importantly, with most of that precipitation moving across the northern plains, it looks like a drier trend will start to develop across the central and southern plains. Nebraska sits at the periphery of that, so we may actually see a little bit more precipitation that's currently expected. So Troy overall looks like a decent pattern coming up. We're not seeing a lot of widespread precipitation, at least in the next four or five days, but then we see more increasing precipitation trend next weekend. And after that, from the GFS model, it looks like a more warm and drier pattern establishes itself perfect for growing our corn across the state. Thanks, Al. You've probably heard how a number of meat processing plants in Nebraska had to temporarily close or slow down production during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. The fallout left some livestock producers with the tough decision of whether or not to euthanize animals that had nowhere to go. And even if it never came to that for you, it was a grim reality nonetheless. That's why the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources is encouraging people to see how they can help through the disaster care program. Market Journal's Bill Dodd has more. It's a hard time for many livestock producers throughout the state and around the country. Many market-ready animals are unable to be harvested due to slowing or closing meat processing plants, coupled with smaller meat lockers being inundated with orders. This scenario has left many producers with the gut-wrenching decision of having to euthanize their livestock. This is going to be a large job to handle, and those at UNL's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources are working to ensure producers can get the materials they need through the Disaster Community Aid Resources Exchange website. This website is set up to be on demand and available at any time and essentially to facilitate the connection between the firm needing the material and the uh, individual who has material available. So anybody can access the website by going to disastercare.unl.edu. You do have to register, which only requires an email and a password. And then you can click on one of two buttons, either I need to locate resources or I have resources available. And if you click on I have resources available, then we have a fillable form that will ask you a number of questions about uh, the amount, the location, um, if you have a charge per ton or per bale or or per yard, and then it will also ask if you have the ability to load the material at the site and or deliver material to the farm, because we know that this may be something that producers need to find. For a producer who wants to find material, they can go onto the website and click on I need material or I need resources, and then they can see by county what has been um, posted on the site. And so from there, it's, it's up to the producer to contact the source that they find and work with them to facilitate exchanging the material. So we really don't have any role in, in the actual exchange of the material or, or making the connections between the, the people who need the resources and the people who have them. While donations of materials are welcome and appreciated, a task of this magnitude requires a lot more material than any one person is likely capable of delivering. For that reason, those in charge of facilitating material exchanges are requesting donations of carbon sources for composting in very large quantities. So right now, we currently are looking for large volumes of carbon material, which is essentially any um, dry or semi-dry plant-based material. So this could include wood chips, um, wheat straw, chopped corn stalks, um, you know, any, uh, any crop residue type product. And we're looking for large quantities. So while we realize that a lot of people may want to help, um, what we don't want are some small donations or listings of yard waste and materials like that. If, um, if citizens have a community dump site where they take their yard waste, then we would appreciate those municipalities um, listing those materials online. But we're, we're looking you know, for several tons or several cubic yards at a time. And so for some of our larger swine operations, they may need 15 to 20 semi-truck loads of material to compost uh, the number of animals they have. With livestock production being a very large part of our state's economy, it stands to reason there will be a number of producers from the Missouri River to the Panhandle who will be in need of or have resources to make available 
However, the state's pork producers have been dealt a very heavy hand throughout this ordeal. So right now, it's it's primarily our swine producers that are in need of these materials, and they're they're fairly um, located on the eastern part of the state. But we do have some swine facilities out west as well. Um, there's the potential that the cattle producers may need this service down the road, and so we would just encourage anybody throughout the state who has materials to go ahead and post those. It may not lead to anyone contacting you, but it it might um, you know might be something that is willing to travel a great distance to get a hold of as well. When it comes time to dispose of any livestock, there are several guidelines to bear in mind. The first recommended step, however, should be to contact your local NRCS county office. The NRCS is offering equip cost share for um, helping pay for this process. And so if they, they start with them and, and go through that application process, then they'll be in touch with um, NRCS and uh, Department of Environment and Energy experts that are helping um, pick the correct sites for these uh, compost piles to be placed and, and help them with the building and design. So we essentially, our, uh, our, our recommendations with the compost pile is one, to use plenty of carbon material. Um, the more, you really can't use too much. Um, the, that carbon material serves as um, a source to absorb liquids and to insulate the piles so that the compost process um, heat up and, and actually decompose the animals that way. Um, we need people to be aware of water quality concerns, so um, these need to be located in places where there's uh, at least four feet to groundwater and um, preferably in soils that are not well drained. And then any runoff that does occur from that site needs to be contained. It shouldn't be allowed to flow away from that compost site and, um, and off of the property or into waters of the state. This is sure to be an economically and emotionally devastating ordeal for many people dealing with the meatpacking supply chain disruptions. Hopefully the Disaster Care website will be a resource producers can rely on to help them secure materials and gain a bit of certainty in these uncertain times. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. Staying on the livestock side of things, if you've tuned into Market Journal over the past several weeks, then you've heard from various experts talking about COVID-19's impacts on livestock, particularly slaughter delays and bottlenecks in the supply chain. UNL ag economist Dr. Azadine Azam has studied the economics of the meatpacking industry for decades. He tells me COVID is forcing us to rethink how we look at consolidation in the meat industry. Remember, only a handful of companies control the U.S. meat market, and when unexpected problems occur, like a pandemic, efficiency can be quickly thrown off track. That hourglass now, that bottleneck, you know, that little thing in the middle, we always looked at it just because these industries, there are only a few of them. Well, uh, it's become narrower. And the reason it has become narrower, well, you, now we have a labor issue. And so with worker safety, what you have now, you have people are getting sick and you have workers who are not showing up. I'm hoping that in the future that this is a wake up call and an education for us consumers that take stake as it is without, or without really thinking about where it comes from. So COVID now has brought to light that in addition to efficiency considerations of meatpacking, we really have to look at disruptions in the channel. So all these elements, in my mind, really uh, have put consolidation under a completely different light. Dr. Azam also says a post-COVID world presents some interesting scenarios as to how consumers will buy their meat. Will the local community butcher play a bigger role? What, what you're really saying is the industry going to go back full circle to where it came from. Because before, <laughs> uh, before uh, when, I, when you go back to the 1800s, before the railroads made their way to the Midwest, the relationships were very much local. But again, as technology improved, we looked for efficiencies. I mean, that's what makes this country so well fed. And uh, we spend the smallest proportion of our income on food. And it seems like we're going back to, to the thinking about what about the local butcher, what about the local... Yeah, that is possible, depending on regulation. And this is something that I don't keep up with. 
is that perhaps there are regulations out there that that makes it difficult probably to develop local uh, slaughter plants or local butchering. I really don't know. This is all going to shake out, and we may go to a system where uh, the locality of food is going to become um, an attractive proposition. Perhaps people, based on this terrible experience you know we're going through, they may be willing to give up some efficiencies and be willing to, to pay more to make sure that their food sources are assured within a, a smaller geographical area. And as for how the pandemic could affect Nebraska in the longer term, Dr. Azam says one of his main focuses will be on the labor market. If, I, if there was one thing that I would focus on is labor. To ignore labor now, knowing what laborers have gone through. And I'm not just talking about, I'm not just talking about the, the disease and, and oh yeah, those things are very important to look at. But how is the market uh, for labor uh, affecting all these uh, and, and, and all these uh, you know the industry and consolidation? For example, is there monopsony in the labor market? Because a lot of these laborers may not have alternative employment just like farmers sometimes don't have alternative outlets for their cattle and their hogs and so to answer your question i, I i'm going to uh, uh, hopefully focus on the labor market and probably work with some folks in omaha a couple more notes dr azam says consumer preferences technology and regulation drive the meat industry and it's important that the system we have in place balances efficiency, market power, and fairness for packers and producers. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media so you can join in on the conversation. And don't forget, you can get the latest updates on the coronavirus outbreak at covid19.unl.edu. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Molwin. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.